Right, well, um, let me tell you a little bit about myself, I guess, and what, what I'm going to talk about. Um, the slides I've got here are from a talk I gave last year um, at the Royal Society. Um, the Royal Society, being a long-established scientific institution, has finally realised that computer science is actually a subject, as opposed to a branch of either mathematics or engineering. And so it suddenly got involved in computer science, and the archivists and librarians realised they were going to have to know what this subject was. So they arranged a little history conference and asked some of us to go along and talk about what we've been doing in our lives. Um, the Earmost Transputer is something I will talk about with these slides uh, because it's probably the thing that I've spent a, a fairly large amount of my life involved with. Um, uh, but a little bit of history about me. Um, I, um, um, most of the history of modern computers fits within my lifetime, which tells you roughly how old I am. Um, I was born a year or two after the first computers were built. Um, one in Manchester and one in Cambridge, and 20 years later uh, I found myself as a computer science student being taught by the two people who built the Cambridge machine, uh, Morris Wilkes and David Weaver. Um, the other person that, that, from that era who deserves a mention is Martin Richards, um, who was the person who devised the BCPL programming language, the first truly portable uh, programming <coughs> language, which found its way to Bell Telephone Labs and was the precursor to C. Um, so the, the, the C's was directly a descendant of BCPL. But, but it, I got very heavily involved in BCPL because it was the only language that uh, anybody wanted to use that was running on the computer I started to use as a postgraduate. Um, and the compiler had never been completed, so I ended up completing it and discovered what it was like to write compilers, um, uh, which has been a very important part of my life. So I'm one of these people who's actually been involved in both software development, compilers and things, and designing microprocessors. And I have a claim that you should never let anybody design an instruction set unless they've written a compiler. <laughs> It's very easy to design features into the instruction set, which cause enormous grief for the compiler writer and optimizer. Um, anyway, so that's the, the sort of starting point. I graduated, um, I think I was the first graduate from my Cambridge College Kings in computer science, the first ever that is. The computer science program in Cambridge had only been running for one year before I took it, and there were about 25 of us um, in this, this little cohort. Um, and. Uh, um, so um, I, I then, however, been fascinated by this exciting new topic, which was artificial intelligence, 1972. Um, uh, went off to Warwick University, which had some fairly adventurous work in robotics and AI. Uh, and robotics was what actually drew me into um, this issue of, um, uh, of how to design microprocessors. Um, I started trying to... Microprocessors had just come into existence in the 1970s, um, uh, the initial ones were four-bit processors that were used to build pocket calculators and things. Um, and, but anyway, they got better over the years. Um, and I started trying to use these things to, to build robot control systems. Um, and I had this great idea that if you had a collection of microprocessors, you could dedicate them to individual actuators and sensors in the robot, network them together, program them, job done. Um, and being young and foolish, I went off and tried to do that. Uh, I, the, 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 I soon realised that the AI was going to be far too difficult and defected from AI into designing programming languages for government programming and ships to, to, to go with them. So that's where this, I, that's how I got involved in all this stuff. Uh, what button do we press to move on here? Um, does that one work? Yes. Okay. Um, so there were some other people involved in, in all this work. Um, the, the ideas that, that went behind this transputer, as it's called, um, originated, as I've said, in the 1970s. Um, I had been developing this robot control thing along with a programming language that was called EPL, uh, one of the first concurrent programming languages that we had running to program these systems. Um, through that um, activity, I got to know Tony Hoare, who you may well have encountered somewhere along the line. He's well known for a, a, num a number of things, ranging from a quick sort uh, to um, communicating sequential processes. Um, and uh, uh, communicating sequential processes was his attempt to design a language system for programming concurrent systems, um, published in 1978. Um, and I got to know him at the time that work was going on, and we met more than once uh, after he'd moved to Oxford as a professor there. Um, the other person that's uh, very relevant to the story I'm going to tell is Ian Barron, um, who was a, a, an entrepreneur, really. Uh, he'd uh, developed what, mini-computer called the Modular One, 
um, and set up a company, Computer Technology Limited, to make it. Um, and this was the machine that I encountered at Warwick University when I moved there. Um, and my colleague, uh, uh, Colin Whitby-Strevens, who'd been working also on operating system software for the Modular One, um, knew Ian, um, and so we, I got to know Ian through that route. Um, so the three of us, and others of course, that were, were all involved in, in this kind of idea of building a, um, a kind of communicating microprocessor, microcomputer. Um, uh, and the, Ian uh, labelled it the transputer, a sort of fusion of transistor and computer. And the concept was that uh, in the past we've been designing, or designing systems with logic gates and Boolean algebra. Now it's time to up the game and design systems with microprocessors, microcomputers, and concurrent programming languages. So describe the system in, in the concurrent programming language, and then take the individual processes and tasks in it and map them onto processes, processes transputers. Okay. Um, so that was the underlying idea. Um, which was floating around for a year or two, um, and then an opportunity arose, um, because Ian, um, having parted company from his original venture, um, had got involved in various advisory roles, and one of the things he was doing was advising the UK government, which at the time believed it had to have an industrial strategy. It was a Labour government, so that's not, not particularly surprising. Um, the new one is going down exactly the same route, I notice. Um, um, the, uh, and uh, Ian had um, uh, been involved in this role, uh, and there were two other important players here, Dick Patrick's and Paul Schroeder who were US entrepreneurs who'd, who'd just made a lot of money by selling a company called Mostec um, for an awful lot of money. Um, they were multimillionaires and, and there were a lot of others with them in the company. Um, Petritz, in fact, was a, a, one of the well-established people in the semiconductor industry. He was originally known for developing the 7400 series logic family, um, which became the mainstay of, of electronic design in the 1970s, effectively. Um, and moved on from Texas Instruments into these various additional other ventures. Um, somehow, and then there was this important element uh, uh, in this, this story, the National Enterprise Board, as it was called, which was a, uh, a sort of um, a, a publicly owned venture capital bank. Um, uh, it was set up by the, the Labour government in the 1970s with a sort of mainly an aim of rescuing a number of rather failing public sector companies, uh, but was it talked into um, the idea of investing in entirely new industries. And, and Ian Barron went and told them the story that if they wanted to have a microelectronics industry, they had to start somewhere, and the great idea would be to invest in a new company. Um, so they did. Um, and <laughs> uh, and they, wrote, they wrote the story to get the funding uh, to support that. Um, the, um, the plan was perfectly sensible. It was to actually set up manufacturing in the United States where they knew how to build semiconductor memories uh, and then transfer the memory technology and the manufacturing process to the UK. Uh, in the meantime, in the UK, we would be designing microcomputers and things with transputers that would eventually be put through the manufacturing plant and sold, thereby establishing uh, a presence in the microelectronics industry. So that's where um, this lot started from. Uh, you might notice that the, the uh, potential Labour government that we might have sometime uh, it now talks about a, a national wealth fund, uh, which is exactly the same idea, in fact, as the National Enterprise Board, as far as they can see. Uh, good luck to them. Um, um, so, uh, it was quite a lot of money. Um, uh, Inmos was founded with 50 million uh, of venture capital from the UK government, which in 1978 was, was a lot of money. Um, it was an accident that it was that amount of money. They'd originally written a plan for about 10 million, and uh, um, and and Ian said, I, I think Petrix wrote this plan. And Ian said, I don't, you know, we ought to double that to just to make sure there's enough. So they doubled it and ended up with 20 or 25 million or something. And then they showed this to the guy that was running the National Enterprise Board. He said, Oh, you guys always don't don't put enough money into the budget, um, and so they doubled it again. Um, and then they had to figure out how to write a plan that was cost four times as much as the original one. But anyway. It, it worked. Um, they set up operations in Colorado Springs. Uh, they didn't want to do it in Silicon Valley because some of them were convinced it was all going to disappear down the San Andreas Fault. Um, uh, it hasn't done yet. So that's okay. um, uh, and um, it, it, the, the activity grew quite rapidly. Uh, here in Bristol, they decided with quite a lot of Compl complication because of the politics of it. I mean, the, the, there was a desire here to create employment, partly. Um, so they were trying to put these activities in, in areas of, of, of unemployment. 
Uh, Bristol turned out to be a good solution because the manufacturing operation was put in Wales, in Newport, and the design and, and headquarters was put here in Bristol, which was a great place to recruit people all those years ago, and still is. Footloose industries tend to move to places where people like to live, and, and Bristol is an obvious example of that. Uh, the Bristol team grew very rapidly, uh, partly because of an interesting um, recruitment accident. Um, we decided to recruit one or two uh, graduates straight out of university uh, and um, sent a, rather hurriedly uh, some flyers around to advertise the, the opportunities. Uh, invited 21 or two of them to Bristol for a sort of interview and a get together. Um, the lady that was organising all this talked to some of them and said to us, well, they all seem to have four or five job offers in their pockets, so if you're going to want to get four or five, you're going to have to offer them all jobs. So we did, and every single one accepted. So the, the, the team doubled in size in the space of a month. Uh, the average age was very low. Um, the experienced people amongst the team, that's me, were at that time 28. Um, so there you are. It was, it was very youthful, uh, very innovative, probably somewhat over-innovative as a result, um, and went ahead with all this development of the transputer architecture, a new programming language, which we called Occam, um, and we started work on prototype chips. Um, and over the, the following four or five years, um, the articles were published, the transputer, uh, articles about the transputer, and eventually it was launched. Um, the factory was built in 1982, and, and Ian Barron was always very keen on doing fairly avant-garde things, even with, computer, with, with building architecture as well as computer architecture, and hired the Rogers partnership that had done things like the Pompidou Centre to design the manufacturing plant. This turned out to be a very good idea. You, you can still see it if, as you drive along the, the motorway, the M4, if you look to the left, uh, just past Newport. Um, and, uh, <laughs> The design, the aim of the design was to keep the manufacturing floor very flexible, so big open space. So basically this thing has tent poles standing up and the whole roof structure hangs from the tent poles. That's what makes it so distinctive. Uh, and, and all, of course, like the Pompidou Centre, all of the infrastructure sits on top of the roof. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning here is the Japanese uh, project. Uh, I, the Japanese in the 19, uh, around about 1980 founded this thing called the Fifth Generation Computer Project. Um, at that time, Japan had taken over the world for making motorbikes and, and, and cars and things, uh, and but wanted a real computer industry. Uh, so they poured a lot of money into um, projects to um, sort of revitalize the, 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 the emerging computer industry. Um, and, and it turned out that some of the, the aims there aligned very well with the technology that we were developing at INMOS. Um, they had ambitions to do artificial intelligence and robotics and all this kind of stuff. Um, now, when we started trying to design this uh, machine, um, the first thing, the intention originally had been to move the design tools over from the, the states, the same tools, uh, and then use them so that everything will be compatible. Um, but it turned out, to our horror to some extent, that the, um, the design tools being used in the chip industry at this time were little more than drawing aids. Uh, there was a computer, but its primary purpose was to, was to, to, to di digitize large drawings that people had done, still store them in a computer and then print them out again. Um, um, and the guys were literally expected to design all the layout of the chip in, in, in colored pencils and things, and then check circuit connectivity by put, putting the plot off and comparing it with what they expected in their, their design. Um, we thought this was totally absurd um, and decided that we would build a proper design station. Um, However, in 1980, there weren't any colour workstations um, available. Sun Microsystems started making the first ones a year or two later. And of course, things like the Apple Mac and so on is in 1984. Um, so all the, all, we were just a bit early, so we built our own. Um, we, were, we had 21 young, foolish people. You know, you, if you don't tell them what's impossible, they'll just go and do things. So this is, this is a great plan. Um, and we, um, one, of, one of those uh, interesting 20 odd people had actually, uh, at the time we uh, uh, offered him a job, he um, uh, had said, well, I've actually already got a position at California Institute of Technology for a year. Do you mind if I go there first? Uh, we said, oh, that's okay. So he went over there and Carver Mead at the time was actually developing some new ideas on how to actually represent and input chip designs and things and get them synthesized automatically. So he basically brought all that stuff back and implemented it. Uh, uh, and uh, 
Um, and so it did all kinds of useful things. It checked the inter circuit connectivity automatically uh, we, against our hardware description language that we'd, we'd also designed, um, and it checked design rules automatically. So we, we knew, our designers knew that the stuff they were putting in was actually going to produce correct designs. Okay. Um, and we built some special synthesis tools um, for processors, essentially, the da data paths with the registers and the arithmetic units and so on, um, and the microprogram control memory and so on. These were all tools that we added to our design system to make the design of the, the transmitter possible. Um, and it was all programmed in this language called BCPL, uh, to which I'd added a garbage collector. Um, uh, I'd actually done that at Warwick University which, uh, as an experiment, um, not being sure whether it was feasible to put a garbage collector into a typeless language, um, uh, but it, w it was, it all worked fine and we built all this software uh, around that technology. Uh, I think about 10 or 15 years later it was reinvented and it's now called conservative garbage collector. You might have used one. Um, in the course of the exploring many possible options for the, uh, micro the microprocessor and its instruction set, um, we had all kinds of extravagant ideas, and I've got some fairly thick files of them still. Um, uh, but I soon realised that it was going to be totally impossible to fit all this stuff onto a single chip unless the processor was very simple. Um, at the time, um, people were using a whole chip just to put a processor on, then you put that on the circuit board and you put some memory with it and you put some I.O. devices and so on. So it was a board-sized computer typically, not a single chip microcomputer. Um, so one day I thought, this is going to have to be really simple, what's the simplest computer I can think of? And this is it, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> uh, uh, this was the starting point, and I called it the simple one. And then there was a simple two, and a simple three, and a simple four, until we got something that we thought was a viable product. So it has just four registers and a, and a single byte instruction set, because I wanted the, inst the instructions to be very compact, because I knew we wouldn't be able to fit very much memory on the chip, um, and so on. And then, there's, of course, there's the additional instructions uh, that eventually have sprouted instructions for doing process scheduling and communication. Um, um, so that was the starting point for the simple one. And at the same time, we were developing this concurrent programming language, uh, which was called Occam. Um, this is um, my friend Tony Hall's letter to me when he uh, made a, a valiant attempt to write a specification of the programming language. Um, and actually the following 30 or 40 pages actually give the formal specification uh, with a very rigorous algebraic semantics, one of the first uses of algebraic semantics uh, in, the, in programming language design. Um, uh, Tony's, this was Tony's classic style and actually the, the, he would sit down with a pile of blank paper and just write 30 or 40 pages off the top of his head, uh, typically double spaced so he could go back and actually put the corrections in there for us before the next draft. Um. <laughs> And there is the actual, uh, the thing progressed. You notice it's now called the Simple 42. Um, now there weren't actually 42 revisions. In fact, by, this, by the time we wanted to build this thing, we actually got up to n number seven. Uh, but um, uh, my young friends uh, who had been watching The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy at the time um, thought that it would be much more exciting to call it Simple 42, uh, the, the answer to the meaning of life um, in, the, uh, in that uh, thing. So uh, that's where the 42 came from. Um, and around about here, you see, we've got channels here, we've got uh, the discussion of processes comes in and their workspaces and synchronization between processes. These were all built into the instruction set um, uh, of the design. Now, there it is. Uh, this is the one I could find. It's a picture of an actual real device built in 1983. Um, and you can actually make out the, uh, the data path here in the logic unit. Uh, that is the microcode control ROM uh, over there. And uh, uh, instruction fetch here. Um, and uh, this was the experimental chip that we fabricated. Uh, around about two micron technology, I think. Um, so you know, linear dimensions about, you know, nearly, well, not, not far off a thousand times bigger than <laughs> the chips that we make these days. Um, and, um, uh, you, can, you can't see this very clearly. Yeah, the, 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 they started putting the designers' names on at the top corner there, and, uh, but eventually my friend ran out of patience and put UTC at A on the end, Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. Um, and, uh, over the other side is um, the, the, the guy that designed the CAD system uh, decided to put a bit of artwork to fill the gap there and put Fat Freddy's cat. 
In case you don't know who Fat Freddy's cat is, uh, Wikipedia will tell you. Um, he's a character from the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers comic, described as a quotes underground comic featuring trio of stoners. <laughs> So this is the sort of general outline of the Occam language. Um, it's uh, essentially, obviously it has sequential programming in it, it's got conditionals, and along with that it has parallel, uh, <coughs> executing two things at once, um, and alternative, which gives you the ability to um, select one of the, uh, a number of potential communication channels depending on which one becomes ready first. Um, uh, so we, we've got channels, communication using message passing, um, uh, and timers, because it was obviously designed for real-time uh, computing and processing. Um, one of the things, important inputs from Tony Hall was to try and make sure that it was possible to check lots of correctness criteria in the compiler and tools. Uh, so we had uh, disjointness checks. We, the, the processes were not able to share variables directly, they always communicated using channels. Um, and um, T Tony was quite insistent about the importance of this and I soon discovered myself that he was absolutely right. Um, uh, every, every time I've watched people trying to program with shared variables, something has gone horribly wrong. Um, and uh, um, the, they just um, result in programs that uh, have non-deterministic behavior. Um, so uh, we, we, um, uh, one of the things that turned up in the algebra that uh, I thought was almost a joke originally was the process stop, a process that starts, performs no action and never terminates. I know that sounds like a fairly useless thing to do, um, but actually if you, uh, if when an error occurs you cause the process to, does it to stop, um, then effectively you prevent errors sp spreading to the rest of the system and you can use that as a means for for incorporating redundancy and building reliable systems. This is a simple example of the algebraic semantics that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, the Oxford people did quite a bit of work on this, inspired by Tony. So you see you can write down things like the associativity of sequence. P sequence Q sequence R is the same as P sequence Q sequence R. Um, and, um, and then this is, this is the rule for the meaning of an output and an input on the same channel executed in parallel. It's the same as the signing from the outputting process to the inputting process. And using laws like this, you can build up the semantics of the entire programming language. And this is what Tony Hall uh, and his <coughs> colleague Bill Roscoe actually did. Um, the language was obviously designed for programming transducers, but it, interestingly enough, it was later used and picked up for synthesizing microcoded processors. So there's a paper somewhere that I published called Compiling Occam into Silicon, which used the same module library that had been used for the transputer processor. Um, and it also uh, was picked up by a community that was trying to explore asynchronous hardware design techniques. Um, so there is a, a, there is a sort of almost a demonstration there that if you have a concurrent programming language, you can unify hardware design and software design, something I'd still very much like to see happen 30 or 40 years later. Um, um, they, they were somewhat too diverse. The other thing is, of course, that this thing has a semantics, which most hardware language, design languages don't have. Um, the semantics is what you get when you run the synthesizer and the gates turn up. Um, so that's the sort of um, timeline, which I think reflects what I said earlier, really. There's the, 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 the specifications, the, the, the programming manual, of course, had to be written, uh, tutorials and all that kind of stuff. We moved on to another language when we realized that we needed to put some extra data types in to support things like floating point arithmetic and so on. Um, uh, wrote an article for the, for the, the SIGPLAN um, journal in 84. Um, and started demonstrating things by the time we had the hardware. But that simple 42 processor, uh, actually we put on a board uh, surrounded by the memory and other things that were needed and started demonstrating it just to show people that we could actually make processors. Um, um, and uh, we created, created a, a, a portable version of the Occam programming system for um, other mini computers. Um, uh, and Tony and Bill t talked about this work and on the semantics of Occam at, um, uh, at one of the big conferences in Tokyo, uh, uh, at which point we were partly trying to persuade the Japanese that Occam was a logic programming language, I think, because they were very fond of logic programming. And you know, by talking words like predicates and things, you can convince people it's logic. 
Now, so that's where the conference was, the Cayo Plaza Hotel. And here is the man giving the talk on the transputer. <laughs> it is me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's called the Transputer Implementation of Occam. So I was really trying to emphasize the fact that this was a, Occam was the program methodology and the transputer was the implementation of it. Um, and, um, and so that's how we did it. Now th this turned out to be a very good plan because we'd, we'd struggled really to get getting the American community very interested in this work. Um, I mean, it's a, you know there was a lot going on in the States at the same time and um, they tend to stick with American stuff rather than taking things from little places like the UK. Uh, but having, having attracted a lot of attention in Japan where uh, the, the Americans were busy watching what this big project was going to do uh, uh, and so those of Americans turned up at the conference as well. Uh, so that way we spread the, the word about the transputer and Occam uh, far and wide. Um, so the idea generally of this thing was that you run multiple processes on each processor. The processor had a built-in um, uh, scheduling system for the processes into, into the instruction set. Um, uh, and uh, we were the first microcomputer to integrate a lot of memory, well a lot, four kilobytes. See why I had to keep the program small. Uh, the the pre 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 precursors to this, the microcomputers, mostly had, I don't think any of them actually had stored program memory for, uh, 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 random access memory for uh, programs. They, they were, pre the, the, the early ones were purely read only memories that were, that were pre programmed uh, to perform specific functions like being a pocket calculator or something. Um, we were definitely the first microcomputer provide, to provide direct interprocessor communication. So this was the first microcomputer designed for concurrent and parallel programming. Um, and we didn't need any kernel operating system or anything, or even an assembly programming, because the Occam um, language was compiled directly to the instruction set. So they were designed very much uh, to fit together. Um, um, and there is a, actually, I put this down here because this is a very important design principle that actually is, is, is I think, mentioned specifically in Tony Hall's original paper. Um, it's that you keep the cost of communication roughly similar to the cost of computation and roughly similar to the cost of memory access. Um, this is, uh, if you can do this, then it makes it relatively straightforward to take computations and spread them across multiple processes, for example. Um, uh, and um, it's an interesting um, uh, observation, this, because this is, the, this is the, the, the idea that's gone horribly wrong over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, the, the, the cost of communicating uh, data between uh, nodes in current supercomputers is nowhere near this. Um, um, so, there's something to reinvent. Um, so they, it took us quite a while to get this transputer launched uh, uh, and actually in people's hands. Uh, it was complicated a bit because the government changed, of course, around, around about 1980. And the incoming Conservative government thought the whole idea of the National Enterprise Board and its investments in what, what crazy things like INMOS was, was just not where they wanted to be. So they were busy trying to sell us for the next four or five years. Um, and they finally succeeded in selling us to this thing called Thorn EMI, which is a strange conglomerate of everything from, from consumer electronics and, and TV rental to, to military uh, equipment. Um, that wasn't a very good move because the Thorn, uh, Thorn EMI really didn't have enough money to, to support the ongoing investment into Inmos at the time. So although we were succeeding commercially, there the, the just wasn't, wasn't the investment to, to really see it through. And it was in fact sold three years later to SGS Thompson Microelectronics. Um, and, um, uh, which again wasn't ideal because they actually hadn't much idea about how to sell things like transputers or microcomputers. Um, the one good thing that happened as a result of the sale to Thorny and is that lots of us who had found a stock in Inmos suddenly found we got some money. Um, so. um, anyway, we went ahead, uh, we got out the, the reference manual for the, uh, the transputer, we demonstrated the prototype um, uh, in one or two places. Um, we um, wrote things up and there was this company, Mako, uh, which was a spin-out from Inmos. About half a dozen of the engineers who had been involved in the transputer got a bit impatient uh, and went and set up a, a, a parallel computing company in Bristol. 
Um, and uh, actually, we had the sense to actually place a contract with them for building a parallel computer out of transputers. Um, so the first machine they, they actually made was a box full of transputers uh, which could be used to show off the capability of it. Um, and, um, uh, and it was in fact shown off at typically doing things like graphics. Um, um, where, where, which of course are quite easy to parallelize. It's, this is still the way in which rendering is done for movies and stuff. Um, you, you hand off frames and parts of frames to individual processes to do the rendering and collect the results back. Um, and uh, finally we managed in 1985 to launch the thing um, in London and New York and Tokyo and so on. Uh, so that was the point at which the transfigure actually really came into existence physically. Um, there is the original launch uh, manual of the book, and you can see, uh, I think the reason why we put a picture of the chip on, uh, on there was to convince people it was real, <laughs> <laughs> after all that time. But you can see here, that this is the memory, the four kilobytes of random access memory. This is the processor, which looks a bit similar to that one I showed you before, the prototype, the data path here, and the microcode controller on. And these are the four uh, communication links um, that connect to the pins and, and, and then all you have to do to connect two transmitters together is to join the corresponding pins up and then you can execute input instructions on one of them and output on the other and the data just flows from one to the other. Um, and uh, we were able to do things like this. Uh, this is the 42 transmitter board um, uh, that was just the number we could fit on a, a VME card at the time. Um, and um, we made a lot of these. Uh, I seem to remember this was a mistake of some kind. I think somebody misprogrammed the, the, the packaging uh, machine in, on the production line with the result that a large number of fully functional tested die were put into the packages 90 degrees rotated and, and automatically bonded and stuff. Um, so we ended up with about 1,200 um, fully functional but totally useless chips. Um, which gave me an opportunity of saying, that's okay, just write them off to engineering, we'll do something useful with them. Um, and we stuck them on boards like this and gave some of them to our friends in the high performance computing community, uh, where they experimented with mounting physics simulations and things on them. Um, others we put in a box and, and stuck them on. I um, uh, used them to do demonstrations um, on the, um, uh, of typically things like graphics. Um, um, and Mandelbrot mm. was the other one that we got to Mandelbrot at the time, if you ran the Mandelbrot program, you found the pixels turned up one, two, three, so you, you wait minutes to get the whole frame full. This thing could just render the whole thing. Wow. Okay. Um, there was a, an occasion on which a gentleman from uh, Hitachi um, was um, looking at a, a, a box of these things on a stand that we'd put at SIGGRAPH. And, um, he then started wandering around the back of the stand um, and said, where is your supercomputer? Because he didn't believe that this could be achieved with a box of tricks, this big and stuff. Um, <laughs> he said, no, no, no supercomputer, it's all in the box. And he said, well, how do you store it? He thought we'd pre-computed the entire Mandelbrot set to some huge depth and was more prepared to believe that we could store information than we could compute at this kind of speed. Um, so it was quite a sort of interesting um, uh, uh, device, this. Um, that, of course, led us into a new class of applications because uh, we, we rapidly got into things like graphics, there were some AI applications, uh, there were even some neural network things programmed on these, these boxes of transputers, um, uh, signal processing, accelerators and things, plug-in cards for PCs were all, all, all available. Um, and people started to build parallel supercomputers. Um, and of course, immediately they wanted floating point arithmetic. Um, at the time, the uh, emerging standard, the IEEE 754, uh, was just beginning to be adopted. Um, and we took a full advantage of that. Um, uh, you won't know this, but uh, before the IEEE 754 standard, floating point arithmetic was an absolute minefield. Every manufacturer had invented their own representation. Uh, slightly different approaches to rounding modes and all the rest of it. So when you tried to port floating point software from one machine to another, it never worked properly. Uh, you had to go and revalidate the whole thing and rerun test programs and probably edit, modify it quite a lot. So the, the, the IEEE standard was a, a revolution and we, we took advantage of that. We extended Occam and built a software package um, and of course started to get involved in trying to verify the correct operation of that, that uh, package. Um, and um, discovered how difficult it is to, to do this kind of thing. If you think about the, 
This, this thing has 64-bit six, operands, um, um, several different rounding modes and things, so what do you do? How many test cases do you run before you're convinced it actually works? Um, and um, we were, we were, I, I was watching all this stuff running and so on. Then bugs started to appear, not, not only in our, in our implementation, but in the reference implementation. We'd taken a widely used available product, the 887, the Intel's curve to go along with the 886 microcomputer uh, and assumed that that was correctly implemented. <coughs> Uh, that assumption turned out to be wrong. It had bugs in it. Um, so um, I, I was at, at, a, at a Royal Society meeting that Tony Hoare had invited me to, and I heard um, Don Good, um, who uh, was fairly well known at the time, uh, had been experimenting with uh, essentially formally const constructed software. Um, and somebody asked him at the end of his talk, well, how long does it take to write software this way relative to the normal way you do it? He said, well, probably four or five times as long. And I thought, if we'd spent four or five times longer writing the floating point package, but actually knew that it worked properly, that would be a bargain. Um, so, um, so I then, of course, had to try and persuade somebody to um, uh, build a formal proof of the correctness of the package. Um, and um, one of um, Jeff Barrett, one of uh, Tony's uh, PhD students, actually took up the challenge uh, and did a <coughs> proof of the correctness of the Ockham package. Um, and then we were able to use the algebraic semantics of Ockham to prove that the correctness of the microcode, the, 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 the microcode implementation that was used for the hardware, actually matched that, um, that software package. Um, that also caused me to encounter another interesting challenge, which was to actually get engineers and mathematicians together and persuade them to talk to each other. Um, something which turned out to be, uh, and has turned out to be very valuable over the years. Um, uh, it was uh, so effective that we were actually able to launch that device ahead of our schedule, um, and it was at the time of introduction the fastest floating point microcomputer in the world, um, um, and, um, and led to some fairly interesting projects, such as this one. Um, this is the uh, Edinburgh Concurrent Supercomputer, which uh, uh, the man here, David Wallace, persuaded the government to fund. Uh, it's a great big box full of transputers made by this Bristol company, Mako, that had been a spin-out of the original uh, InMOS team. And of course the Edinburgh project uh, continued and is, is basically now the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre, which is one of the biggest computing centres in the UK. Um, we went on to, of course, to develop other things. Uh, general purpose concurrency um, was one of our aims in all this stuff, and we realized that, um, that you had to do a lot more work on this communications aspect. I've already mentioned communications, but if you, if you, our original architecture made it possible to do very fast communications between adjacent directly coupled transputers, but we soon realized that you wanted to be able to put large clusters of processes together and get high-speed communications between all of them simultaneously. Concurrent communications is essential if you're trying to do concurrent programs. Um, and um, we built the first, what I think was the first uh, VLSI implemented uh, routing chip, a 32-way switch, um, um, which was specifically for solving this problem. The idea would be that you build your network up out of the switches and then put all the processes around the edge of the network. And it was designed very much for being able to do this concurrent communication. Used a novel technique, uh, which I don't, was, has been used to some extent, randomization. Uh, Les Valiant, who um, I'd known for a long time, actually professor at Harvard now, if he hasn't retired, um, uh, came up with this very nice idea of um, how to spread the load across a, a, a communication network. And the, his idea was, first you dispatch your message to a randomly chosen intermediate point, and then you let it progress to its destination. Um, which may sorry, sound crazy. It's like saying, you know, avoid the traffic jumps in Bristol by driving randomly in a mile or two, and then go to where you want to go. But of course what it does is to spread the, spread the, uh, the, the, the load to, to use up all the capacity of the network. And there it is. Um, that was the board that was used to demonstrate and show it off. The, these are all the links coming off the edge. Uh, on a, 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 we invented a faster communication link than the original transputers, uh, standardized it as IEEE 1355, and I think you can still buy it in the form of space wire. Uh, it's used for satellite communications. Um, sorry, within the satellite, that is not communication to the satellite. <laughs> Um, th there is the legacy, um, in a sense, 
uh, of all this work. Um, it, uh, the, our user group had, had a lot of people um, uh, and uh, because we attracted so much attention in the, in the academic and research community. Um, many of these people were themselves actually teaching groups of students about transputers and concurrency. Um, dozens and dozens of projects um, and a lot of transputers used in supercomputers and things. Um, and it was also found its way, or the processor in particular, we built a reusable core based on the transputer processor and it was actually used in some high volume products such as set-top boxes. Um, the company that had taken us over, STS, Micro, STS Thompson, uh, has had numerous customers in, 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 in consumer electronics and so this was a good fit to that kind of uh, area. Uh, I mean, it's quite likely that um, um, uh, you will have, uh, your, your, your parents have probably have bought some things with transputer processors in, <laughs> if they have a set-top box at some point. Um, so, and, and, and it, it actually, the, the, the fallout from all this, I mean, I've already mentioned Mako as a spin-out, this was by no means the only one. Um, uh, Division was another one that started doing uh, virtual reality, or tried to do virtual reality headsets and things for games in the 1990s. Um, which wasn't terribly successful, but but they're still around. Um, in in they, they they split into two or three other companies that have, that have still got a presence here, um, and um, the Bristol Technology cluster is actually very large. It has thousands of people in it. Uh, numerous companies doing microelectronics design, and lots of other software development around it. Um, uh, software development companies as well, um, um, and. Um, uh, so in a sense, you, you know, the, the, this, this was a successful government intervention in growing new industries. It could have done with investment over more than the five years that it actually had it before it was sold off to other, other, other places. Um, those, this is just a brief list of some of the embedded processes that are around here. These, are the, these were the ones we did within, within the Inmos ST thing. Chameleon was actually not something you would know much about from a public point of view. It was actually a, one of the first designs that I, I did this for systems on chip. Uh, the company had numerous design groups which, which would cover all kinds of things from DSP and video processing and so on and so on. Uh, if you tried to build a product that put them all together it was easier to redesign the whole thing from scratch because they're all incompatible with each other. Um, so I came up with this idea of having a standard architecture for system on chip development um, and we ended up calling it Chameleon. And actually, the interconnect uh, architecture of that uh, is still in use within ST 20 odd years later. They called it ST bus in the end, I think. But, uh, uh, so they build these things that are compatible with the protocols and things that were built, d developed in this project. Um, the other companies that have moved in here to take advantage of the skill base created by um, Inmos people like Infineon who do the tricore processors which is all the, the processor calls for uh, automotive electronics. Um, Firepath uh, was the uh, element 14 which was acquired by Broadcom around about 2000. Um, um, there was another spin out from um, <coughs> Inmos into uh, um, which was Pixel Fusion um, and then ClearSpeed which did G some of the earliest GPUs. Uh, in fact, uh, Simon McIntosh Smith, that you will almost certainly know, worked for them uh, for, uh, for quite a while. Um, uh, there was a company in Bath called Pico Chip, which uh, was building uh, building a razor processors, simple processors for doing signal processing and wireless communications. Um, and of course, um, uh, slightly more recently than those. Um, we have um, things like Exmos and Graphcore. Um, Exmos came about because after I moved into the university in 1995, in 1995 I got to the point in that I decided that uh, I didn't really want to work in a big company like ST Microelectronics. I'd rather do something different. And it was either a question of doing a new startup or something else. And the university asked me if I'd like to join the computer science department, uh, so I, I did. Um, and one of the one of the things I did fairly early on was to introduce some fairly um, entrepreneurial project work um, um, for for quite a few years. The final the final the entire final term of the fourth year uh, was spent writing a business plan and building a project to to demonstrate it. Um, uh, one of uh, one year, I had a student came knocking on my door saying, um, "I'd like to do something with computer architecture. What, if you've got any ideas." And I, I had actually got a draft of uh, an instruction set design. I said, "Here, why don't you try this?" Um, and um, he got to see it and so on. And just as he was about to get out of the door, he said, uh, "What will I do for software?" And I, I rather 
I said, I, that's all right, I'll, I'll build you a compiler. Uh, I, I've never been so skillfully managed by a student in my life, I don't think. Anyway, he, he got to the point of having a, 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 a field program, or Gatorade program with the instruction set, uh, executing programs from the compiler that I'd written uh, with him. And um, uh, he wrote quite a nice business plan, and so we managed to um, persuade one or two of our friends to invest in it and uh, uh, drew in another CEO to get the company going, and that was the beginnings of Exmos. Um, um, and of course, um, you know, other things that more recently have come up, that like you've probably heard of Ultra Haptics, Ultra Leap now. That was another product of essentially the same kind of, um, of project work. Um, Graphcore is one of the latest kids on the block. God knows where that's going, but um, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, now, sometimes when I've given talks like this, somebody says, is it still relevant? Well, <laughs> here's an observation. Um, um, we, we have been relying on Moore's Law for a long time. Um, uh, and uh, one of the reasons that's been possible is the scale of investment uh, that, has been, that has been available because of globalization, everybody wanting PCs and then smartphones and things. Um, and so you end up with these things where people can actually afford to, to build the manufacturing plants, or at least a few people can, uh, to build the 10 billion transistor chips. Um, they're very difficult to understand um, if you actually start struggling to try and really understand what's going on inside some of those, um, those chips with complicated memory hierarchies, multiple processors and all the rest of it. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, and now there's, uh, there's stacks and stacks of software, some of them rather large and uh, difficult to understand. Um, and, uh, uh, and actually, it, it caused an extraordinary level of centralization. Um, if, if you look at the chip that is currently in the latest Apple smartphones and things, um, only two companies in the world have factories that are capable of making that chip, uh, Samsung and Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, and they both rely on a piece of manufacturing equipment that comes from ASML in the Netherlands. So we have managed to create a situation with a single point of failure. Um, uh, and also, of course, we've also got the, the, the fact that we seem to have managed to put half of the world's high-tech industry on either um, um, geological fault lines or geopolitical fault lines. Um, so, so it would be sort of better if you could find a way of building systems from simpler components that can be put, that are understandable, trustworthy, can be put together easily uh, and can support safe programming languages, okay, which is what I think we were always trying to do. And also trying to make sure that this, this little uh, relationship is actually implemented. Um, uh, so I think that would be a great uh, objective. Um, and, um, uh, and let me finally just encourage you, following on from these observations, um, to um, try and, um, when you graduate, if you haven't already, uh, focus on things that are understandable, sustainable and ideally genuinely socially useful. Um, um, I am um, still unconvinced that um, uh, an Alexa in the cloud is a better way to switch a light on and off rather than a light switch. Um, or, or that I need a self-driving car. I mean, you know, the world, we, we want to get as many cars off the road as possible. What you want is a, to use the technology to build a, a, a shared transport system that works efficiently and doesn't destroy the planet. If you started with a blank sheet of paper to design a transport system, you would never design something in which all of us drive around in a tin box. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> um, so, there you go. Thank you. Um, and um, um, I'm happy to answer any questions <laughs> about anything. <laughs> When, I, when your president approached me, he said, you look like an interesting person. So there you are. I've told you about some of what I've done, but uh, there were lots of other threads there as well. I think the first thing is to decide what you actually want it to do. Um, because, I mean, you know, there's, there's a sort of, there's been a tendency here to just keep on putting more and more stuff into these things. And you look at it, do you, don't you really need it to do that? Um, you know, the fact that you can do it doesn't mean you have to. <laughs> um, 
Um, I mean, I, I, um, I, I, I make very little use of this other than as a telephone. You know, I go to the smartphone shop and they show me all kinds of things. Look, I just want to make telephone calls. <laughs> Um, and uh, um, so I, 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 I think the first thing you do, do is what is what functionality do you actually want, need, and so on. Um, from that you can probably, well hopefully, if you can convince yourself that there are some, you know, that being able to communicate is the most important thing, and then all the extra accessories <laughs> are accessories. So, I mean, uh, it, was, it was sort of almost predictable that, that this thing would, 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 would become a computer. I mean, I remember saying, you know, we were going to be carrying around computers in another few years, when, when I was looking back in 2000. But, but, you know, the fact that some of these things are technically possible doesn't necessarily mean that you should do them. Um, I think self-driving car is an obvious case. But mind you, that's probably not technically possible without some fairly serious modifications. I mean, that's a classic case of, of foolishness, in my view. Um, well, with you know, the demonstrator was driving a, driving a, a car down a Californian highway. If you've driven along a Californian highway, you'll know it's a fairly simple environment. It's just it's got the, the white lines and stuff, and not much else, you know. Um, and uh, so you, the training set for the AI and everything, or, or even programming the, the AI, isn't, isn't very challenging. Um, if you look at the the issue of, of, of trying to drive a, an autonomous vehicle along the streets where I live, with, with cars parked on both sides and people wandering in and out and all the rest of it, what the hell is the training set? Um, um, you know, what, 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 what so things that would not bother or confuse a human being would, would, would never have been in the training set. Um, I mean, supposing you're driving a car along and there's a, somebody walking on the pavement with no clothes on. Nobody would think of putting that in the training set for a self-driving vehicle. <laughs> Anyway. Um, just curious, what do you think about modern languages like Go and Rust that have implemented channels in the same sort of CSP concepts, but they're not real channels in the same way that Transfusion or Explore has their sort of fake software things? Do you think that's still the right approach? Well, well I mean, uh, without, I, I haven't actually looked in great detail. As Rust seemed to have roughly the right kind of ideas. Um, I mean, there's, di this is, there's different ways of doing this, which, 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 which you, know, you can have do things in a safe way without necessarily following exactly the way that they've been done here. Um, the, um, uh, I mean, in fact, even in the, the Exmos language, um, we um, installed this notion of, um, of ownership, uh, which wasn't in the Occam version. You, know, you, 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 you see, the transputer was actually highly optimized. When I realized that we were trying to do this message passing communication, I um, uh, put in a very fast block move operation into the hardware, um, which was basically doing back-to-back -back reads and writes of, of data to make quite sure that you could actually copy even quite a large message quickly from one place to another. Because um, uh, I knew that if we didn't do that, people would start trying to share memory. Um, now, an alternative to that is, is, is to, of course, to, to, to have a notion of ownership. So you've got to sort of point a thing, but there's only one of them, and when I give it to you, I don't have it anymore. Uh, and again, that, that can be built in at either at the software level or ideally at the hardware level. So you have a mover instruction as well as a, a store instruction, for example. Um, so, so I think there's, there's you know, you, you, there are, I, I, I absolutely believe that you should have a properly thought through model of the concurrency um, uh, in the programming language where, you, where things can be checked in the compilers and then properly supported by the, by the machinery. Um, but there are, there, are, there are different ways of doing it. Um, and I, I, in a way, you know, it's, it's a bit disappointing that in, when was this done? 1980-ish. So 40, 40 years have elapsed, more or less, since this started. And, and we really haven't moved very far, have we? We've got, we've got Occam, <laughs> Rust. <laughs> You can count the number of serious attempts at a concurrent programming language on the fingers of one hand, I think, over that period. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, why that is, and, and so on, and, and to some extent why there's been so much focus on, on supporting all, the, con all the, the sequential programming languages. I have a theory, uh, which uh, is almost impossible to validate, which is that one of the reasons, one of the things is that people find sequential programming quite easy, because it's like storytelling. And we tell stories from when we're this big, so you know, sort of. So you tell the story, and you're telling the story of what the computer is going to do when it starts executing. Whereas actually, when it, when you, you're conceptualising a concurrent program, you're actually more or less doing so. It's more like hardware design, um, you know, drawing pictures effectively, and, and 
that maybe doesn't come so naturally. Um, what do you think is the most promising recent development in technology in general? For your choice of recent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know. God, I don't know. Should have sent me that question in advance. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I'm, 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 you know, the, the, the thing I'd like is to be able to walk out to my front door and just um, do something here which it puts in the postcode of where I'm trying to get to or something, and the nearest taxi takes me off the pavement and drives me to the train station where I've already got the seat booked on the train, and at the other end there's something waiting to pick me up and take me where I want to go. Um, that was my dream in 20, 20 years ago. I thought we would, this would be the, for almost the first thing we'd do. Um, that sounds like an example, like one of, sort of Tony Hall's examples, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just a simple question, but the actual first uh, transputer chip, the one with the four kilobyte, how, yeah. how big was the scale? Like? Uh, the, 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 the geometry at the time was about one micron, uh, the sort of feature size on the, on the silicon. Now, now you're down, you know, 400, uh, two, two or three hundred times smaller than that, I think. What are we at? Three or four micro, uh, nanometers? Uh, I think it's what they, they say, but, but of course the other thing that's happened is that is that we um, uh, anyway so so they and they and they're about seventy or eighty square millimeters these chips so it's a bit under a square centimeter um, and so you can get about that that thing I showed you has about two, a quarter of a million transistors on uh, now, now you're dealing with chips with with forty or fifty billion transistors because you know, the linear dimensions of of the features have scaled by two or three hundred. Uh, which gives you a very big factor when it's <laughs> good <the> area. <laughs> so, so that's what I mean about this. I mean, there has been a, you know, but, it, but it's come at a very high price. That's why it costs you 10 or 20 billion to build the manufacture, build the factory. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> um, the, other, the other thing that's happened is that, I mean, the, the, this Moore's law thing is actually, is, is partly a story, storytelling because effectively um, what Moore correctly predicted was that you could just keep scaling the geometries down and putting more stuff on. And that held true for about 20 years after Moore's Law. But by 1990, it was already becoming quite difficult to do some of this stuff. Um, um, you know, the, thing, the thing is, if you, scale, if you scale the geometry of a transistor, it goes faster. But if you scale the geometry of a wire to make it thinner, it's more resistive, so it's slower. Um, so how do you deal with that? Well, what's actually happened is that these days chips have many, many layers of interconnect stacked on top of the active components. So there's typically, well, I don't know, at least 10, I think in some of the processes, there's 20 layers of wiring and stuff on top of the thing. To, to, so we, we've escaped into the third dimension. But again, this, this comes at a price because this means there are lots and lots and lots of steps that you're putting, putting one layer down and then, then planarizing, putting polyfill in between the thing to flatten it out. Otherwise, you end up trying to build a motorway over a mountain range, effectively, by the time you've got to the higher layers. So they, they've got to put, put the, the connectivity on, put planarize, more connectivity, planarize, and so on and so on and so on. And that's how your state of the art chips are built up. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's effectively there's been a, a constant stream of, of development of new manufacturing process to sustain this Moore's law thing that was supposed to come for free. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, the EU and the US have both been investing heavily in semiconductors design and manufacturing, um, whereas the UK doesn't seem to be following this trend. Um, and they're doing it for kind of national security and um, you know maintaining kind of a level of competence within yes. society. In Bristol, we've heard kind of of rumours of some of the biggest, fastest growing companies in the Bristol cluster having to you know, um, have layoffs and kind of slowing down. Do you think it's time for the government to kind of step in and start pumping money into these companies, or do you think that they should be doing something? There are two things that need to be done to. Um, uh, um, effectively um, get the UK seriously engaged in this kind of technology. 
Um, it has to be done at a, at a realistic scale um, in terms of investment, av availability of expertise and access to markets. So uh, rejoining the European Union is absolutely essential. There's no, there's no possibility of the UK having, having sovereignty over this kind of technology uh, by itself. Um, um, the, um, and the second thing is that, well, I mean, money was being pumped into various things through the, the, the European Union projects. Um, so, uh, now you can try and find a different way of doing that if you like, but you're going to find... <laughs> and of course, the, the other thing that the European Union was doing was, was very much to do with this issue of standardising things, which, which is what gives you the big market without having to make endless variants <laughs> of every product. Um, um, the, the, I, as you probably gather, I was fairly staggered by the um, uh, Fool, uh, <laughs> foolishness of <laughs> <laughs> abandoning that one. <laughs> so, kind of a follow-up to my question before, but... So, Rust is, like, really similar to XC in terms of the ownership of the rules. Do you think that if XC had been open source, there wouldn't be more contribution from other people and that might grow beyond just XMOS? Um, so I, I, uh, well, of course, the, the, thing, the thing was that uh, I, I, the, the open source thing is, has become much more pronounced over the last few years. And, and uh, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I um, have been trying from time to time to persuade um, uh, Exmos to do some more open sourcing of things. Um, and they, I did tell them they should have a licensable version of the technology available, and that's partly because the um, um, people like Apple these days actually basically license things. They, d they don't buy chips off people, not much. But most of what goes on there is that they license designs, that they license technology and then they do their own designs. Apple have one of the best chip design teams in the world. Um, so they use an architecture license from ARM, um, uh, not, not the, the technology, uh, the, not, not at the level of the implementation, which they can do better themselves. Um, so. Um, uh, yes, I think I think you know there's there's a sort of I, I think I think the, the the world's probably changing a bit here because I think what you've got to do is to look at the fact that, that there's, there's there's open in the sense of completely open, um, uh, and, and one issue with that is is you're rather dependent on a, on a philanthropic community making contributions to it all. Uh, if you actually want to maintain something properly, you probably do need some money in there somewhere and a team to do it. Uh, systematically, um, which would tend to, in a sense, to want to drive you more towards a, lic a licensing model in which you are licensing. But there's a long, big spectrum in between here. I mean, you know, I can I can give you a um, a, 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 li a license. To, uh, I can take a piece of technology and give you a license to it and support um, uh, for you to use in a real product. At the same time as having things that you that people like students and academics can use for free. Um, so you know, I, I think we're going to see the emergence of um, um, a sort of model which is open, but on a whole spectrum of freely open to um, uh, li licensed open. Um, I mean, the, the, there is a clearly a huge advantage to these things being being available on some basis, um, and trying to lock things down so they aren't just mean people don't want them. Um, I mean, I remember having a stupid incident. There was a, a when I was doing some of this work, I. I tried to make use of a, a piece of compiler technology that had been developed by our military people uh, at the, um, what used to be called the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment. And they, they got a great, um, their idea was that you ship software in a thing called the Architecture Neutral Distribution Format, effectively. So this is, this is it's like a bytecode or something, you know, so you compile your software into this. And, 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 any, and any system that is to be consistent, compliant with this thing has a compiler that will and translate the architecture neutral format into the local instruction set and so on. So, you know, we, we've seen all this kind of thing started to emerge. Well, um, I thought I was doing fine until um, 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 I said, well, we, you know, we, we're going to have customers who would like to own their own technology in case they need to make modifications to it. What's it going to cost? Oh, no, we're not going to do that. I said, look, I don't, just give me a number. <laughs> the, the customer doesn't care. <laughs> Ask them for a million pounds. Oh, no, we're going to... <laughs> so, yeah. but I, I think it's important to have, you know, what people want is, is, is essentially to know that things are available and, and what's, what's the price. Um, they don't like to become dependent on other organisations that might get bought or go bust. <laughs> One 
when um, <clears throat> when you said Occam became portable, what does that mean? As opposed to a non, like, what is a non-portable language and what does a portable language look like? Um, well, the the, the, port, the portability of the, um, um, the, the the thing I mentioned originally, VCPL, I mean, you know, you know, the structure of this thing. But my opinion, which was, I think, probably one of the f first people to realise that if you, you could basically break a compiler in half to, to a well-defined point, he produced a, a very cl clearly defined intermediate language, which was looked a bit like an instruction set. Um, uh, and um, the, all of the semantics and, 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 uh, and translation and stuff of the of the language into that stuff was was, was completely independent of the final instruction set. And then you have a code generator that goes from that point onwards. And so so to port the language around, you have to rewrite the code generator and then bootstrap it. This is a process that you probably been taught about or may even have done. Um, um, that's, uh, and, then, and actually the other, the other technique that's sometimes used, that was used for BCPL and we had it for Occam, was to have a, an easily implemented interpreter for us, for it. so there's a lang another a, a similar idea. You trans there's a compiler that, that translates the source into a into a very simple instruction set, which you, which you can write a very easily write an interpreter for in almost any any language that you like. Typically C or something like that. Um, and and this gives you ways of porting languages around. I mean, the reason why the Unix operating system became so rapidly and well established is, is is largely to do with the fact that it was written in a portable language, most of it. So people could actually move the, the whole operating system by moving C from one machine to another and then recompiling the operating system. So in a sense, it was almost, you know, the, the, the secret of Unix becoming, becoming widespread was as much to do with the, the, the fact that it was written in a portable language as it was to do with anything to do with the, the OS design. Um, it's a quite an important idea, this, this bootstrapping stuff. Hiya. Yeah, I'm, um I've seen some other recent uh, programming languages where their uh, approach to memory safety is to make um, more information available to the debugger so that when a problem occurs, it's easy to see how that problem came about. Um, so, what do you think of that approach versus the approach like Occam and Rust take, where they bake the safety into the language so you can't not be safe? Yes, I, 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 I know uh, something about that, but not as much as I probably ought to. There has been some work to do with, uh, uh, with actually there's been work to do with analysing uh, and checking shared, shared memory uh, concurrency uh, over, over the last five or ten years, certainly. In fact, who the hell did it? Um, there's a piece of work. There's a piece of work that I think originated in University College, which, which when the guys did a spin out and, and then, then got themselves bought by Facebook. Um, and I think they're, they're, there's, they're, they're, there's quite a lot of that kind of technique being used inside some of these fairly big chunks of software right now. I don't know much about how 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 safe it is. <laughs> I mean, there certainly is a whole area of of um, what, what do you call it, runtime verification, effectively, where you're, you're uh, doing things, which, which you're watching what the program's doing um, and um, intervening or, or you know, stopping it, <laughs> doing things it shouldn't. Uh, which is probably, ultimately, the only way you're really going to get to grips with, with systems which have got embedded, trained AI stuff and so on. I mean, I, I can't imagine making some of them safe, other than by having things that are going you know, to identify when they, they might do something dangerous. And, and intervening at that point. How are we doing for time? I don't know how long you would. <laughs> You'll have to get me back if you want to ask some more questions. <laughs> if ever I'm done, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> really interesting.